Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mike Van Dusen, Executive Vice President of the Woodrow Wilson Center. I'm hearty welcome to all of you. Um, uh, this is precisely the kind of event we like to have, a very important topic at a very crucial time and the right speakers. Um, Africa can help feed Africa. Um, you know, I think, about the Woodrow Wilson Center. We are the official national memorial to the 28th president, and uh, we serve to convene good meetings, get the right people in the room to discuss important public policy issues. Uh, we welcome you. We also welcome 150 scholars here in the course of the year. We are a public-private institution, and we're very proud of the work our Africa program uh, does. And I want a special welcome. I see some former scholars that have been at the center here. Uh, I see some current scholars here, and I see some, f some former very senior officials from the State Department. Thank you all for, for coming. Um, today, the Wilson Center wants to provide safe political space where the worlds of policymaking and scholarship can interact. Uh, by discussing relevant and timely research and promoting dialogue from all perspectives, the Center works to address crucial current and emerging challenges confronting the world and the United States. Uh, I hearty welcome to uh, Vice President Mukhtar Diop. He is the Vice President for the Africa Region and the World Bank. He pre previously, I believe, served uh, um, uh, in a variety of positions involving Latin America and Africa, including being the World Bank's country director for Brazil the last uh, three years, I believe. Uh, Mr. Diop has had previously served uh, in the Congolese government as the Minister of uh, Economy and Finance. Uh, Sen Senegalese, sorry. <laughs> Senegalese, that, that's a real slip. Congo's on my mind, I don't know why. Um, he earned a master's degree from the University of Warwick in economics. Uh, we're very happy to have him here today, and I hope you have a very good session. Uh, Vice President uh, Mukhtar Diop, we welcome you to the center. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you, and thank you for being here today. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure and honor to be, to be here and uh, to be in front of uh, this uh, wonderful audience. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a topic. Uh, it's a topic that is uh, obviously very, very important for uh, for Africa for development. Uh, and uh, yesterday I was uh, meeting some of my supervisors when I was student uh, doing my doctor my uh, uh, graduate studies, and uh, we were discussing about exactly the matter of uh, trade and uh, regional integration. Because uh, at that time we we were working in a center for uh, uh, in, uh, integration and. Uh, and trade in Africa and uh, the very topics that we were discussing today was uh, a source of a lot of uh, re uh, work that we are trying to do, trying to understand a little bit more of the dynamics of uh, trade in Africa. I would like first uh, really to uh, thank all of our, our uh, uh, panelists today, Ambassador Matos Sumbana, Dr. Karanja, Mr. Todd Amani, uh, and all participants to this, but I would like first to recognize my dear colleagues who have been uh, 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 leading this effort. Uh, Paul Branton, who is, um, who is leading our trade practice, who has been uh, writing not only this report, but another report on, uh, on trade in Africa that uh, we released uh, uh, recently. This is a, a report which is a part of a series of reports that we are uh, preparing on trade. And we wanted that the first uh, following report, uh, which moved from the general issues of trade in Africa, be focused on, uh, on, on food, to be able to give some indication of what we can do to move out from this cycle of a very uh, quick and short uh, uh, responses that we have in the face of this crisis. I would like to recognize also my dear friend and colleague, uh, Marcelo Jugale, the director for Prem and Economic Man uh, Management who has also been working uh, in Latin America, uh, uh, who also will be bringing that, uh, uh, that perspective. Um, 
what we're trying to, to, to say in this report, and what uh, Paul will uh, eloquently tell you later a bit more, uh, and Marcelo, is um, that Africa can, can feed Africa. We believe that there is a potential in Africa to really, uh, with the right policies, to be able to uh, increase significantly the production of agricultural good in Africa, and therefore help uh, African country to be less uh, 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 handle much better all these external shocks that uh, we are facing and having the poverty impact that we, we believe uh, a better agricultural policy is, is, uh, can have. So Africa can uh, really produce uh, what it needs in terms of food and should do it. And um, why it should do it is because high food prices are becoming the new normal. We are moving in a situation where you had a stability of world prices uh, in, in the food area to, an area to a situation where we have a lot of volatility in, in, in prices. This volatility uh, make uh, 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 people to 870 million people uh, e who are suffering from hunger are, uh, are victim of these uh, fluctuation in prices that uh, particularly affect uh, producers which are often net buyers in, our, in, in Africa. Uh, region. We are uh, noticing that the poorest of the, of the producers are often net buyer of, of staple. So they, therefore any variation in the world prices of staple is affecting adversely the poorest uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Africa. Let me give you some, uh, some uh, example of, uh, of what uh, these rising food prices can have as an impact in the medium term in Africa. Africa has been one of the uh, fastest urbanizing uh, region in the world. The demand for uh, 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 food staple will be increasing significantly in, uh, in, the, in the near future. And that increase in, uh, in, uh, in uh, food uh, 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 price, in food, uh, in f uh, demand for food will uh, continue to create a, a, a pressure, uh, a price pressure on, uh, on, on that food. food. So the, Having <laughs> these uh, 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 small producers in a rural area being net buyer in a context where the demand for food uh, in the urban area will put the prices up, will affect, will have a second round effect on poverty in the rural area for them. We estimate that uh, by 2020, the urbanization, the population, the urban population in Africa will double, and therefore the demand, the elasticity for, uh, for uh, uh, the elasticity for the demand of, of, uh, of staples is, 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 is higher than one. Therefore, you will have an, a, a relatively higher increase in the demand of staple in, uh, in Africa with the increased urbanization that we are seeing. That put a lot of pressure in terms of really removing all the obstacles in terms of productivity and in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, barrier. Another factor which is uh, important in Africa is that we have a very, a very small amount of the, of the fertile agricultural land which is being uh, cultivated. We estimated that only 10% of the 400 million hectares uh, of land in uh, Guinea savan savanna zone has been cultivated and been used. So there are many factors linked to that, very low irrigation, very low productivity, very low access to, to a, a certain number of factors of production. But that is something that is a, 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 a currently uh, an obstacle to increasing really ra rapidly the production uh, of, uh, of uh, food and uh, increasing uh, the, uh, uh, the availability of, uh, of food products in, in Africa. Another big ex uh, 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 constraint is the fragmentation of the regional food market and the lack of predictable policy that really have been an obstacle for private investors uh, to invest in Africa in that sector. Yes, With uh, this segmented market and uh, the economy of scale, which are very, very low in Af in, in a, that we can have by increasing that size, we have uh, currently a situation where uh, uh, where, where there is a very little incentive for private sector investors, particularly FDI, to come in Africa and invest in this sector because the return is m much lower due to the very small market uh, that they, are, are, uh, they have to, to feed. So 
there is uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, challenge is certainly to increase regional integration and to increase the size of the markets that are uh, uh, that are offered to to investors in Africa. E, uh, and this uh, small market and this fragmentation of our market is also having uh, creating some barriers to uh, to productivity in Africa. We have a certain number of barriers which are not tariff barriers, but which are regulatory uh, barriers. We have regulations which are outdated and which limit access to a certain number of important inputs for production. For instance, the bed seeds, uh, we, uh, we don't have a, a common uh, framework for, the appro for, uh, 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 for uh, uh, determining the quality of seeds and the availability of seeds. So every country has to, to have its own regulation for accessing seed of quality. Unifying that market and make it much more unified market and much more competitive market at regional level will lower the cost of seed and make and increase therefore the productivity of uh, uh, small scale farmers. We see a lot of, uh, of export bans, uh, uh, permits, licenses, uh, uh, costly documentary requirements, and all those are, docu uh, are, are listed in our document. And I think Paul will be able to give you some, some, some interesting example of how those barriers and those uh, <coughs> bureaucratic uh, 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 constraints can affect productivity. But those are the kind of immediate uh, 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 constraints that we're seeing in terms of movement of good and particularly uh, of inputs in, uh, in, uh, in, in Africa. We, the second uh, 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 big constraint is, is uh, transport cost and uh, the lack of investment in uh, uh, trucking and shipping capacity. We, uh, we saw that uh, those, uh, not only there is low investment, but there is also a certain number of, uh, of uh, policy recommendations which are made to that industry which are affecting the productivity of agriculture. We have an example recently will show that when the trucking industry was liberalized in Rwanda, it has been able to lower significantly the cost of transportation, which had an impact in the production, agricultural production. So it's not only uh, specific measures about input, about agricultural production, but you have so th some of the reform in or some of the sectors which can have externalities and can help really increasing that uh, the productivity in agriculture. The, uh, we have also uh, uh, those barriers that we are talking about at the borders and are also having uh, 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 secondary uh, effects in areas that sometimes people are overlooking. It affects the gender, the gender uh, 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 issue in, uh, in, in Africa. We have our studies show that women cr uh, crossing the borders with, uh, with uh, do trade, trading in uh, in uh, agriculture have been facing much more violence, much more uh, 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 things than, than men in, in similar situation. So these barriers not only are affecting the general production of agriculture and the general movement of, uh, of, of goods, but also is adversely affecting women, which are suffering much more from, okay, from, it's uh, fine. Uh, from these uh, uh, constraints. But uh, to access uh, 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 markets uh, for, um, uh, to access low-cost low seed and cheap fertilizers, uh, e e it will be essential to provide incentive to farmer to in invest in new seeds and fertilizer. In some cases, the nearest market can be just uh, across the border, but uh, the policy framework that it put in place doesn't allow them to to do to to uh, to access those those resources, and I think that the East African co uh, Commission area is a uh, is is an area where you can see that the movement of maize from one country to another is uh, facing a lot of constraints, which are increasing the domestic price of maize in the con neighboring countries. A regional market also with common fertilizer specification could generate substantially lower price when uh, co quantity are ordered uh, uh, for the region. And the lack of uh, an effective system of standards in is a ma major barrier right now to the cross-border and regional fertilizing, uh, fertilizer market. We have also a problem of uh, institutions. Uh, institutions in the, in the region are not very, very strong. 
in terms of uh, d developing regional policies that will allow us to attract uh, 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 private sector and to remove all these, uh, uh, these barriers. Uh, uh, one of the uh, 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 important obstacles has been the, the, the lack of uh, private investment in storage capacity which uh, will be allowing uh, regionally uh, to, to, to store those goods and to be able to little bit mitigate the, the volatility in, in, uh, in prices. The second uh, important institution that will be uh, helpful will be the creation of commodity ex exchange boards. We know that Ethiopia has been recently uh, taking some initiative in this area, which has been uh, 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 helping farmers to, to access and to increase significantly the, the, the level of income because of the information availability that they have in this particular uh, uh, sector. Uh, just to, to, to say a few words before uh, really handing it to my, to my colleagues. Uh, a lot of the, of the issues that we are talking about that we are facing are issues that uh, uh, African leaders are themselves inflicting. It's a little bit a self-inflicted wound. There is no, this is not a constraint that is imposed the, by the WTO in most of these cases, but it's a barrier that countries which are facing and trying to address some political economy issues in their own countries are creating. It's uh, clear that often uh, 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 influent uh, 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 groups, political groups, are, 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 are raising a lot of obstacles at uh, facilitating the trade between neighboring countries because they want to protect the domestic market and therefore increase the rent for some goods. So there is a, a, a very, in this report, we're trying to, to highlight the trade-offs that implicitly some, uh, some countries are, are, are making in not taking those reforms because the, the, the welfare gain that uh, the, the, the lower, uh, the, the poorest in the country can, can make by removing these, those, those uh, barriers are uh, significantly uh, lower. So the, the, this report is highlighting also the fact that uh, uh, e e e e it's important to focus on a certain set and subset of, uh, of uh, very practical issues. And uh, those issues that we would like to emphasize are <coughs> linked to, to uh, investing, as I say, in the trucking industry, focusing on removing some of the barriers that have been set by uh, within the, the, East Afric the, the different community, including the East African community. And uh, for that, the international community can, can help. The way we are trying to help as, uh, at the World Bank is uh, uh, first to work closely uh, within the CADEP with the African Union and the, uh, 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 the Economic Commission for Africa in uh, creating a forum where a policymaker can see clearly the trade-off they are making implicitly by not removing all these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, trade barriers in, uh, in the food sector. And we believe that if, uh, uh, by bringing that evidence to policymakers, it will be clearer that the gain that they will be making uh, in terms of reducing poverty by, re by, by removing those barriers are, are, are significant. And therefore, such a, such, such a, uh, such a report as the one that, we, that Paul uh, and uh, Marcelo will, uh, will, uh, will present to you later on in the Q&A, uh, are, are, are aiming at creating this forum where we can have that open discussion around those issues uh, of, uh, of reform or the, in, the trades, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the trade sector in Africa. It's not only uh, about uh, food, but the same, the same story can be told also in the energy sector, where we have also a series of localized de uh, decisions which are made which are not optimal so solution, where the efficiency, uh, economic <laughs> efficiency can be much higher if we're moving towards a much more in regional integrated solution in the energy sector. This is something that also we are documenting and we will be, be uh, uh, documenting it in various sectors. And uh, at the end of uh, this process, we would like to, 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 to release a, 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 a book which will be capturing not only in the general po policy, uh, trade policy uh, a a arena, but sectorally the impact of those trade barriers on, uh, on, on, on Africa. So I would just want to stop it. It was just a kickoff and uh, to, to give an opportunity to my colleagues who, who wrote the, the report to, to give you a bit more details. But uh, I want, just wanted to, to, to indicate that uh, these, work, these work programs that we are uh, setting is a work program that we see for, uh, uh, for a few years. 
uh, which will be not only focusing on, uh, on agriculture, but we try to be expanded to other part of our, of our, our portfolio, including energy and other, other sectors. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, the way we, uh, is the mic on? Can't tell. <laughs> We're supposed to have these uh, mobile mics now that are, that are, uh, that are wireless, so it's a, it's a little dis disarming to us who are new to it. Uh, I'm Steve McDonald, director of the Africa program here. Um, uh, Vice President Mukhtar has agreed to, uh, to take a couple of questions in advance, but the way we'll proceed today is uh, uh, in just a few moments, uh, he and I will leave the podium and we'll have a short film. It'll talk about the report and its findings. Then we'll bring the panel up uh, to, uh, to have some both outside looks at, uh, at some of these issues as well as uh, invite uh, Marcello to, uh, to come up and, and talk a little bit more about the report. Uh, I do want to, uh, before we start, though, uh, recognize uh, Ambassador Ogoin, who's in the uh, audience here from uh, Benin, who's the uh, Beninois ben ambassador to the United States. And, and I think Ambassador uh, 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 Guga was supposed to be here, but I hadn't seen him, so uh, from, uh, uh, from Akita Fasal. Okay, we won't uh, belabor that. Uh, ambassador uh, Subana, of course, is here, but she will be one of our panelists, so she'll get properly introduced. Okay. Now, with, uh, with uh, no more said there, uh, uh, keeping in mind that uh, we are not only being covered by the press, but we are being live, uh, ca uh, webcast live. So, uh, uh, so if you have, we'll just take a couple of questions because we are, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of time uh, for uh, the vice president uh, before we step down and look at the film. So, uh, do we have anybody with a burning question here? There, John. And don't forget to identify yourself. Wait for the microphone. Uh, John Harbison from SAIS, a member of the advisory committee here in the Africa program. I'm, I'm struck, even startled, that you don't mention some of the structural issues like land tenure insecurities. The part of Africa that I know best, East and, East and Horn, they're, they're monumental. And I don't know how you, could, how you can talk about improving policy without talking about land tenure issues and what we do about them. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll hold that and take one, one or two more questions. Uh, and then allow you to uh, to respond to those. The, the lady at the uh, yeah. no. yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Paul Lee, communications consultant. I was working in Ghana with a USAID-funded project uh, promoting agricultural trade in West Africa, and uh, one of the big barriers to trade was uh, corruption at the uh, at the borders. And um, I know your report does cover that, but I'm wondering if you might address okay. that a little bit. Thank you. Okay. And then uh, Derek, uh, down, Derek, I'm sorry, right here. Okay. Thank you, Vivian Lowry, Derek, the Bridges Institute. Thank you for the, um, for the overview. My question goes back to your comment on um, women, since they are so central to productivity and to trade. I'm wondering what strategies you're thinking about to help integrate them both um, into the policy levels and into um, increased productivity and trade. Thank you. Okay, uh, Vice President Mukhtar, I think that gives you some three good questions to, to end your tenure up here. <laughs> Uh, you know, thank you very much to, uh, for raising the issue of ten, ten, land tenure. The objective was not to, say, to talk about agricultural development in Africa, it was talking to, uh, about trade uh, a barrier. So uh, it's clear that uh, 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 when one is talking about agric agricultural productivity in, uh, in Africa, one has to talk about land tenure. Uh, this is uh, definitely one of the main, obst uh, uh, main obstacles. Uh, what we are trying to do is to really uh, start addressing some of the obstacles and work with the community. Uh, there, is, uh, there are two, two, two important uh, uh, elements. One of them is to how to reconcile large-scale large, large scale producers and small-scale producers. And we know that it's a complex question. And what we are trying to do and, uh, 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 now is to see if you can find a model where uh, small holders are part of a, of a cooperative where they can uh, 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 put together their land and increase, uh, therefore, access to technology for, for large-scale production. Uh, it, it's very important to ensure that the right of small small or small holders are, are, are respected, and that uh, while we are moving in in scaling up and increasing the size of uh, of the of the of the of, of the production area, is not due to the detriment of small scale uh, uh, producers. But I think that the point you mentioned is very important, and not only is it important for that, but it's important also for for so an, a major issue for me, which is the issue of 
irrigated land. Africa, if you want to talk about the general uh, agriculture uh, uh, revolution in Africa, no continent in the world had its agricultural revolution without mastering water, without having uh, uh, much more ir irrigated land. As I come to this job, this is my number one priority. I remember uh, back in the 80s, uh, uh, you had a certain numbers of programs which were launched in Africa in terms of irrigation. A lot of them failed, uh, but some of them uh, uh, continue uh, 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 were successful. And recently, with, uh, in coordination with uh, uh, a lot of donors, uh, Arab donors, African <laughs> Development Bank, uh, we have uh, 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 launched an initiative in Niger around the Kandaji Dam. And what we are trying to do is to articulate at the same time the, the access to energy with hydro and do it in a sustainable way, much more irrigation. But I think land tenure, irrigation, access to technology are at the center of any increase on in agricultural revolution. And I think that you are very right to, I just didn't want to, to, to talk about it by, because by itself, it's a huge topic and very complex uh, 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 topic to address. But, um, but really irrigation is something that we need to, to uh, and particularly uh, uh, the work uh, on dry land and arid land, which is uh, uh, what's happening in Mali, what is happening in the Niger, what is happening in, uh, in I is an indication that you know, if we don't do anything uh, 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 radical and, uh, and, and serious in terms of resources in, 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 in the Sahel, we are not creating the condition for peace, sustainable peace. So I think that uh, we are, uh, this is one of my priority as I come to this job. Corruption, you, I, uh, is clear. And um, I just wanted to leave uh, Paul because this is one of his highlights in his presentation to show the number of, uh, of steps you have to take at the border to be able to cross the border. And it will give you exactly the data. I just don't want to give you my speech. Uh, and it, it, it's clear that uh, the number of, uh, of control you have to pass uh, the border is, uh, is just a, a, a good proxy for, for the level of corruption that you have at, at that border. And this is a kind of self-inflicted wound that us Africans we, we, we make. Because nobody, nobody is, uh, is deciding for African except us that we need to have so many of these barriers at the, at, at, at the, bo at the, bo at the border. So what we are trying to do is to engage the regional institution like the West African Monetary Union, the East African Commission, to work with them <laughs> on, a, on, a, on, a, on a program that will help them reducing the, uh, 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 those control and barrier and reduce the tariff. And that's why uh, Marcelo Jugale here is, uh, is working with the team about uh, on what we call a regional development uh, policy lending uh, uh, operation, a DPL, which we try to to see how we can compensate some of the losses that uh, 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 some uh, country will have by reducing tariff in some areas, by removing some of the constraints so that we can give the incentive to countries to move to, uh, to much more integrated regional uh, 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 area. On women, uh, uh, we are also try, trying to, to do a, a few things on the women agenda linked to agriculture. First of all is to bring evidence. Uh, uh, what was happening often in, uh, in the gender issues, there were a lot of advocacy, but very little strong and rigorous uh, 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 evidence that can help us make the case. So what we have, we had what you call the, the lab, what do you call it? Gender lab. The gender lab, where we have uh, numbers of impact evaluations, which give some rigorous uh, uh, evaluation of the programs which are working, with, uh, 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 including women, particularly in agriculture. So what we're trying to do is to bring all that body of evidence in front of the policymaker for them to understand that it's smart economy to also have a proper gender uh, uh, approach. But we want to move it from the purely principal advocacy to really a fact-based analysis. And I think that right now the, uh, uh, the Africa region in the World Bank is building a very strong uh, body of, of works that we'll be happy to share with you uh, ne next time when, w w if, you, if you wish. Okay. okay, well that's all we're going to have time for with Vice President Mukhtar. So, uh, so let's uh, thank him for his presentation. I think you do have to leave a bit early, sir. So. <laughs> and then I'm going to remove myself and we'll take a look at this film and then we'll bring the panel up. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.
maize is the major staple food in the region. The cheapest source of food which we can obtain. Maize is life here. No maize, no life. Africa lies between 40 north and 40 south. So we can actually produce year round on this continent. Africa in the last 100 years was developed to take resource out of Africa. It's now to say how can we move product around Africa and then move it inland to everyone. More than 70% of the population of Africa live in the countryside and derive their livelihood directly from agriculture. Zambia has the world's largest stockpile of non-genetically modified white maize. Zambia should be a major agricultural exporter, but, but then it's not. The challenges that we have is moving food from food surplus areas to food deficit areas. Last year was a very, very sad situation in this country. There was a drought, there were people dying on a daily basis. I don't see the sense in people dying from hunger. No food, no food supplies. We have 120 million East Africans that need to eat every day. Half a kilo a day per person, that's a lot of food. So how do we effectively grow this product? How do we effectively move it around the region without having to stop at 60 barriers along the way? Every policeman stops and you know, wants to just check it. Governments want to increase trade. We have Comesa here. We have East Africa community here. We have the African Union here. We are all talking of these things, yet a single country. Exporting to its neighbor is a problem. That's the shocking thing. Out of Africa, trade, it's huge compared to the trade within Africa. Trade is not flowing. Why create barriers to trade? Well, we had Nyamakima market in Nairobi. Maize is the staple food for Kenya, and the whole of Nairobi with a population of more than 5 million people are fed from this place. Kenya is always affected by hunger. And there's a big gap between what is demanded and what is produced. We have to consume everything that we have, and even import. We have several challenges, say a country like Tanzania, trying to limit uh, the export of maize. One thing that we don't have in East Africa is we don't know the exact production that we do. There's no exact data that tabulates whatever is exported, whatever is retained. Right. So most governments act out of fear that they'll actually be left with nothing in their country. Tanzania is always perceived to be a surplus region, but Kenya is a permanently a deficit country. So the export ban is imposed to address the food security issues. If we allow just food to go to the rest of the world, and it happens that they end up having no food. It comes back to a cry to the government, and you know, we cannot afford the import bill. We have got countries that argue that in order to ensure food security in their countries, they should prohibit exports. Now they'll just make that argument and stick by it. They will not look at the broader picture, because by allowing freer trade, their people will be able to make a living from exporting this food. These export bans and non-tariff buyers, we look at it in a short term as a solution, but as time goes on, it's a very big problem. The argument is food security, but farmers, they produce to feed themselves, but also sell. I sell, I go and buy seeds, I feed my family, pay school fees for my kids. That's what farmers do. If you produce a lot, borders have been closed, 
because we can't export, prices go down, farmers can't go back the next season to farm again. If last time I planted 10 acres, this time I'll go for four. The farmer in this part of the world harvests and sells it immediately because he has no storage. At harvest time, Tanzania imposes an export ban. Bam. Its own farmer cannot sell across the border. The market is saturated at that point. Prices just crash. That's a major disincentive to the farmer. That farmer would never go back to farming again. You meet a government official, they'll tell you, we don't want our people to starve. There's this feeling that, oh, we need to impose export ban on our country. We want our people to keep their food. Yet, there's no storage for the same food. The farmer needs money. So if they cannot sell this commodity, where will they get money? The moment you impose an export ban, it becomes an opportunity to different people to earn. People will export. People will still export that maize. Now a farmer has produced, they don't know where to sell. So middlemen come in, farmers are cheated, they sell at a very low price. Who loses? It's the farmer. It's the same farmer who is producing who loses. And do you think that farmer will go back and farm? There's a 35% duty on any corn product that comes into Kenya. It's, it's a ban, it's, it's an invisible ban. Last year we had a big shortage in Kenya. So we took this up to the government and said, look, you need to take the ban off. Allow free imports. The government said, fine, we're way off the duty and we brought in almost 20, 25,000 tons. We had all documentations in order, but as soon as the maize got to the Mombasa port, we were actually offloading the maize, and while offloading, one of the ministers stepped in and said, no, stop offloading this maize off the vessel for no reason. He's trying to feed his pockets, probably. <laughs> it's very dirty, it's very political. The same politician is a businessman and you cannot differentiate politics and business. That's the biggest challenge. The export bans and trade bans, and they just sort of add to the uncertainty of doing business in Africa. They can be a real barrier or a real obstacle to doing business. The unpredictable policy environment, you never really know whether imports are gonna be allowed or not allowed or exports. All of these paperworks and testing requirements that have to be done. You certainly you wanna make sure that the product is fit and safe for human consumption. But after that, I mean, if, if private sector wants to buy and sell a certain type of maize, then why not? What is the government getting in there and regulating the maximum share of discolored grains? I mean, is your maize meal going to be snow white, or is it going to be a little bit yellow? You can probably sell it for less if it's a little bit yellow, but it's still perfectly safe to consume. I think some of those things really are counterproductive. In formulating standards, we need to be aware of the way people in this part of the world live. You could otherwise end up with the complicated standards that are not necessary. So we need to make sure that these standards do not actually end up operating as non-tariff barriers that complicate a trade. We supply 30 countries with fresh produce from Tanzania, Kenya and Ethiopia. We've got farmers and groups in Ethiopia who are ready to grow. We wanted to export our seeds to Ethiopia. But the Ethiopian customs regulations is so tightly controlled that we had seeds sitting at the border for a year. We lost close to $10,000 worth of inputs that we had sent up from here for these growers. It's just too tight a control. And every piece of paper has to get signed and stamped. If you've got to send stuff that's urgent, if you have an infestation of pests and you need a certain chemical in time, then you've got to be able to have faster movement. You can't produce anything without fertilizer. Unfortunately, the transport costs are very high. Between Zambia and, and the Congo, there's a lot of corruption. Quite a lot of our clients are actually uh, mining uh, groups. They've been forced by the government there to uh, start producing food, which is a good thing. 
Logistically, it's a, it's a nightmare going through the border. I don't know why there's so much red tape to get stuff in there. Also, there's a documentation also. I mean, it's our neighbor. Bureaus of standards or other agencies, very often they depend on the revenue they collect for their own financial survival. Is this certificate about protecting human health or ensuring quality, or is it about the agency itself generating revenue? They become an interested party in having a system that maybe is actually more cumbersome than it should be. It's not the person who stamps and signs that piece of paper that's going to make the money. It's the bigger picture that makes the money. So you've got to get people to start thinking bigger. Africa needs to prioritize agriculture. I'll just give you an example. Malawi had a food deficit problem. And then we had a government that came into power and identified agriculture as its number one priority. It took certain very simple measures, providing seeds and fertilizers to small-scale farmers. And within a year, they were registering bumper harvests and Malawi became a food surplus country. Horticulture developed after independence. So the government actually gave it a free hand to get up and grow. And in the last 10, 15 years, they've really facilitated our growth. We are now the biggest foreign exchange earner in Kenya, and the government's very involved in that. But the good thing is they're allowing the private sector to come up with what's needed. So things are beginning to work. Before they come up with policies, they should have evidence. We have to have the national food balance sheet as a yardstick where you know that the amazing stock is this, rice is at this level, beans is this, what should we concentrate on? Why do you talk of a monetary union? Yet these small issues, we can't do them. They are talking of free trade. You can export anywhere, but we can't even export maize. The government needs to just ensure the barriers that have existed with respect to import regulations, export regulations are removed. And then the private sector will just get on with it. And that's how we're going to feed Africa. Africa will feed Africa. We don't know what's going on inside the government. There's people there for personal gains. The problem is the game that's being played by politics. We sit in the table and form the East Africa community. The next minute I'm imposing an export ban on my community. Are we addressing food security in the region? We're not addressing. At the end of the day, we're feeding the people. And when we're not allowed to import the staple food of this country, there's a big problem. And we need to solve it. It's just to do with the government. Life is lost in this region because of unnecessary reasons. Really. Really. Because Africa and any region in Africa can feed itself. And, and welcome, Ambassador Buddha. We saw you sneak in late. <laughs> Where am I? Where should I be? Am I leaving my own here? Can I? Yeah. <coughs> now, we, we aren't left with a great deal of time, only a little over a half an hour. Uh, so we're going to ask our, our panelists to be, uh, be disciplined and keep the remarks uh, very pertinent, but as short as possible. And what I'm going to do is introduce each of them uh, uh, now as a group, uh, and then we'll ask them to speak uh, in sequence. Uh, to my immediate left, and our first uh, speaker will be uh, Her Excellency Amelia Sumbana, who's the ambassador of uh, Mozambique to the United States.
Um, she's been in the ambassador, the ambassador here since November 2009. Uh, prior to taking that assignment, she served uh, as a member of the Mozambican Parliament from 2004 to 2009. I won't give you the rest of her uh, bio because I think you have the total one there. Then we're going to ask Tad Omani to, uh, uh, to uh, address us. He's a senior deputy assistant administrator for Africa for USAID. He's been serving with USAID since 1987. He just told me that he's just returned from Mozambique uh, recently, where he was the uh, mission director. So you two probably know each other. Oh, yeah, we, do. <laughs> we definitely do. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so welcome very much, Todd. It's good to meet you as well and know you're there in that position. Mm -hmm. And an old friend, Daniel Karanja, will address us. He's the vice president for the Partnership to Cut Hunger and Poverty in Africa, an organization we've done a great deal of work with on food security issues. And we're very, very happy to have you with us, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, we we will uh, ask uh, uh, Marcello Gijal, <laughs> Gijal, Gijal, uh, who's the economic director of Economic Policy and Poverty Reduction Program for Africa for the World Bank, and of course he was referred to by Vice President Mukhtar um, as one of the two. I think Paul is here as well, who have worked on the report uh, to give us some more insights into the report. So, with no further ado, on my part, uh, uh, Ambassador Subana. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. It's a pleasure to me and an honor to be here with you today with uh, these talented people and the magnificent audi audience. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, the film we just watched is uh, very interesting with some controversial mm -hmm. um, <laughs> statements. But anyway, I uh, assume that uh, it's and they are concerns which uh, face us and we have to, uh, to be aware of. Um, Africa was once known as a dark continent, not because of its people, or the majority are black people, but uh, because uh, um, what was highlighted were the ugly faces characterized by wars, refugees, hunger, instability. But today I'm glad to acknowledge that uh, Africa is being recognized as uh, a new frontier and that Africa can feed itself. That's true. Africa um, is stable. The majority of the continent is stable while we still have some parts. Um, and efforts are being made. We have uh, um, a population, uh, a strong medium class is being created and uh, a market of around 300 million people. Um, Mozambique is part of the African Union family and of the Sadak region. Uh, and is playing its role in the global search for the best and quick solutions to remove this big problem, the regional barriers to trade in food staples. However, to be successful in this endeavor, it's crucial that we increase the crop's productivity, have good and marketable quality, fair and easy access to the market, as well as good governance. We have seen in the, in the uh, film that there are people complain about the governance. Uh, in Mozambique, our first priority is to secure food for, for all. We know the importance of it from past lessons learned during the 60 years of civil war when we had people starving. Today, that spectrum had been overcome, though we are still facing the ghost of malnutrition, which is being addressed in some parts of, of the country. Uh, supply of good health services is part and parcel of all solutions related to creating better living conditions. In close cooperation with different partners in implementing long and medium term plans, we increase soil fertility management and seeds improvement for higher productivity, mainly in rural areas, to increase the surplus. Of course, increasing the surplus brings the problems we have seen also. And uh, we are promoting internal trade 
and exports. Some of our partners in agriculture <coughs> are the G8 countries, the American government through its different agencies, as well as some countries of the South under the South South Co Corporation. The partnership hopes to create a better business environment for private investment, both national and, and foreign. Training of farmers has to be sound and adequate. Uh, agricultural practices is one of the priorities. The access to inputs such as fertilizers, seeds, irrigation systems, it was stressed even by the World Bank about the irrigation systems are fundamental and are being improved side by side with the training of and fielding of extension workers. All the stakeholders are urged to promote the private sector investment in agro-import technologies, improve farmers' access to modern uh, technologies by giving them the right tools to become stronger agro-dealers with access to competitive markets, both individual or through private farmers' organizations, which had proven very important, mainly when the families have small plots. Some instruments are already in place for the SADC region. The 1999 Trade Protocol, which came into force in 2008. Uh, this env envisioned to create a free trade zone with a zero tariff target. Regional cooperation and integration in SADAC are articulated in the Regional Indicative Strategic Development Plan cited by the strategic indicative plan of the organ. They encompass peace, which is very important to the region, security, <coughs> democracy, good governance, trade, economic liberalization, and development, food security, important one, and natural resources management, as well as social and human development. I would like to stress natural resources because in Africa now we know that uh, many uh, resources are being um, discovered and being exploited. Those have to benefit, the communities have to be benefit the people in the first place. Uh, those instruments emboldened with this vision and the re region's proactivity uh, the economic performance in the region is encouraging and is, is, is encouraging. And in the recent years, the average GDP growth rate is around 7%. Um, infrastructures are a huge bottleneck for development. SADC is aware of its role and in close coordination with COMESA, the East African community and other partners are working towards the creation of a tripartite free trade area plan. It is recognized that without roads, bridges, dams, and sound coordinated regional and sometimes continental policies, development in the continent is not possible. To address this problem, SADAC is implementing a broad infrastructure development program including the development of corridors. Many corridors are being developed with high priority to the North South Corridor, which links Durban in South Africa to the Democratic Republic of Congo. Railways, roads, harbors, and other infrastructures are being put in place, and uh, investments is being looked at. Uh, through a tripartite trust fund and investment committee. Of course, the private sector participation cannot be undermined. The region has launched a public-private partner partnership network to facilitate the involvement of private companies in the implementation of the regional projects. For example, 
we urge the banking system in Mozambique to um, finance agriculture. They are somehow reluctant because of the risks related to farming and poor or absence of adequate infrastructures prepared to cope with the adverse conditions of climate changes. They need to be taken on board. So let me start, uh, state that the main problems have been identified, I believe, in the continent, not only in the regions. Some strategies were put in place, like the Strategic Plan for Agriculture uh, Development in Mozambique, we call the PETA, and the CADAP was also here mentioned about CADAP. Those, I believe, are some of the tools to fight poverty, poverty in all senses, including training in relevant skills to in increase food production, conservation, and enhance the importance of a reliable and vibrant value chain has documented in various World Bank publications. Low productivity in the African farmers is well known. But we have to keep in mind that not all solutions are adequate to every situation and realities. There are voices in many countries, including in Mozambique, um, who wave what I normally call a false problem when they talk about land grabbing. In Mozambique alone, we have around 360,000 of square kilometers of arable land available for farming, but only 11% of it is used for crop, crops cultivation. What is the rationale? of leaving this unused land instead of having capable partners to work with it to increase production, job creation, what we have uh, 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 need, and transfer of knowledge and know-how, particularly to, s to secure staple foods, market crops for trade, and local pro processing contributing to local industry. Here's an example without um, uh, um, saying too much about that, because I know that uh, uh, we know what that means. I would like to refer to the GMOs. They are, uh, the farmers, um, in general, are not uh, very well aware about what that means. What are the advantages? and disadvantages. I know that this issue is being discussed in many capitals with no consensus and the doubts arising about the probable consequences of the harmful use, not only to people's health, but also to soil impoverishment. This is still a long debate. Finally, and to conclude, let me say that the paradigm in Africa is changing. Some work is being accomplished to open the boundaries along free transit and circulation of people and goods, specifically referring to Southern Africa, but not exclusive, oriented by coordinated regional and continental policies and regulations. Of course, I agree that some of those regulations need to be updated. They aim to find common grounds and programs to deal with common interests among all partners. Regional and continental integration is essential to increase growth and stability. The economies have to be more global and strong enough to catch the momentum and to be able to go to the mainstream and to the supply chains as decided by the African Union Summit in uh, 2012. Of course, a lot remains to be done.
considering the diversity of the developmental levels and resources of the African countries. Last but not least, security is very important. It has to be taken into consideration in each region where coordination is also fundamental to monitor and prevent any potential present and future instability. I thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Todd? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, throughout, throughout my career with USAID, it seems like the challenge of increasing productivity, particularly of smallholder agricultural producers, is, is, is the challenge we face in trying to improve food security, increase incomes, and it's particularly true in Africa. And I, I think this, the report that the World Bank has put out and the, the film and the, the discussion we're having today helps highlight in particular those issues associated with, um, with incentives so, uh, surrounding the potential to sell, sell uh, products to other countries, neighboring countries, and uh, sometimes the problems of, of uh, getting food from a neighboring country that, that the country needs. Um, Ambassador Simbana did a great job of highlighting the issues that uh, I saw and worked with uh, uh, counterparts there in Mozambique, uh, facing Mozambique. And um, it, it, it highlights, uh, I, I want to just sort of highlight some of the approaches that USAID is taking to address the, these issues. President Obama's strategy towards Sub-Saharan Africa renews our emphasis on spurring economic growth, trade, and investment in Africa, including promoting an, an enabling environment for trade and investment. And uh, as Ambassador Simbana uh, uh, referred to, the, the G8 summit, at the G8 summit, President Obama, alongside 11 other heads of state, including four from Africa, announced the new alliance uh, for food security and nutrition in Africa. And those leaders committed to approach agriculture and food security as an opportunity to increase investment in Africa and rely much more on the private sector to make African agriculture an engine of growth, jobs, and food. Agricultural trade, but especially regional trade across African country borders, is an essential element of making ag agriculture that engine of growth. And the new alliance, which is a joint <coughs> effort between the African Union, the World Economic Forum, and the G8, is already working with six countries to expand agricultural private investment, growth, and trade. One of those is Mozambique, as, as Ambassador Simana mentioned, with commitments to policy reforms as the centerpiece. So we as a U.S. government um, have shown our commitment to this effort through food security and economic, our economic growth initiative known as the Feed the Future initiative at the regional level. And a lot of the focus of our work is regional. USAID efforts for improving enabling environment have advanced cross-border integration and boosted trade. And this work is carried out primarily by USAID's three tra African trade hubs. Uh, a 2011 analysis by the o OECD and the World Trade Organization concluded that these trade hubs have been successful in developing and implementing best practices in customs procedures, processes, and technology. And these advances have reduced the time, cost, and red tape long associated with trading in Africa. The Southern Africa Trade Hub's efforts to extend uh, border operating hours along the Trans-Kalahari border, uh, introduce a single customs declaration, and implement a corridor performance management system contributed to a 12-fold increase in usage of the corridor and a reduction in travel time from 72 to 48 hours. In East Africa, USAID support for customs reform in 2010 resulted in the implementation of a common customs software platform that allows custom officials to communicate virtually across borders. This reduced the time it takes to transport goods along the Mombasa-Kigali trade corridor by five days and reduced the cost of trading goods in the East Africa region by 2%, even despite the fact that the price of fuel rose nearly 20% in, in that same year. So USAID's assistance is often discussed in terms of aid to specific countries, but this discussion really highlights how regional approaches can be used to solve common development problems. Uh, we have worked uh, particularly through the African Union and through the regional economic communities in, in the African area, and Ambassador Simbana referred particularly to SADC, but we're working with the other regional communities as well. Because African-led changes are the most sustainable 
and we're starting to see some recognition that um, unless, um, unless we sort of get rid of these barriers, uh, there, that these countries, particular smaller countries, are not uh, going to be able to benefit uh, and see the incentives that can, be, that can be developed through trade. There's been some discussion of the many complex, contradictory, and counterproductive protectionist measures, regulations, administrative practices, and corruption that uh, constrain African trade. And we have regional trade agreements. They're, the, in many cases, they're just not being uh, implemented, or member countries are not carrying out their, uh, their agreements to implement them. But, I, but I, we are seeing some more interest, and I, I, I hope that this, this report and this discussion can help, help us move ahead uh, to really address these, uh, these issues. And we are working together much more closely with other U.S. government agencies, State Department, Office of Trade Representative, Departments of Commerce, Treasury, and Agriculture, and, and really focusing on the, the prioritized policy agendas that are attached to the new, the new alliance, Ad additional research and analysis to identify these barriers and design policy options, and really uh, creating uh, mechanisms of accountability that build on years of work and investment by the U.S. government in partnership with other African countries. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can continue to focus on this with uh, co collaboration with the World Bank, with our partner countries, and, uh, and make sure that this becomes a continuing element of what we focus on to improve uh, food, and food security and uh, productivity. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Todd. Very good. Uh, uh, Daniel? Well, um, Thank you, uh, Steve, and uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, being a last speaker, you realize that most of what you wanted to say has already been <laughs> said, so That's how we I'll, be, I'll be selective on my comments. As someone who's worked for many years in the continent and also here in Washington, D.C., um, I'm impressed and uh, deeply encouraged by the progress that has occurred in Africa. Um, our organization started about 10 years ago uh, clamoring for change and uh, increased investments in agriculture and food security. And uh, if you look today and listen to people in government, private sector, civil society, you realize that that has been achieved. Many years ago, I remember there was this film that was uh, made that was titled Africa is Open for Business and a lot of people didn't even pay attention. And um, I think evidence now proves that indeed Africa is in business. And uh, if you don't know this, just ask the Chinese. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> business media reports. I agree with uh, the report. Uh, it highlights a lot of things um, that are going on in Africa, things that need to change in order to create progress. Uh, I believe Africa can feed itself. Um, the potential is definitely there. And uh, in fact, I would add that Africa can feed the world, uh, going by the unused potential uh, of land, of water, uh, of labor. Uh, if these are harnessed properly in a way that also benefits the local population, um, I believe Africa can provide more. But we have seen a lot of progress made, and uh, some of it has been because of uh, policy reforms that many countries undertook 15, 20 years ago. Some of them are part of the unpopular structural adjustment program. Um, but we see a lot of improvements in democracy and governance. We've seen reduction in civil conflicts, uh, better trade and regulatory environment. Uh, we've seen more regional economic integration, um, and that's moving forward. Uh, we've also seen um, a, lot of, a lot more increased investments uh, in agriculture, in communication, in energy sector, and these are very, very encouraging. Um, over the last decade, we've seen Africa's agriculture and economic growth uh, thrive. Um, six of 10 fastest growing economies in the world have been in Africa. Trade between Africa and the rest of the world has more than doubled. Um, annual inflation has averaged only 8%. 
foreign direct investments grew about 20% in 2011 alone. Th this is phenomenal. Um, if you are watching news uh, 10, 15 years ago here in the US about Africa, the only thing you could see is uh, civil conflicts, famine, and diseases. Um, the story has changed, and what we are seeing is now there is an emerging story of growth, uh, progress, potential, and profitability. But there's a lot of heavy lifting that's needed um, to be able to harness that potential, and I think that's what we are talking about. And uh, I believe when we're looking at that movie, uh, that's what we were saying, that there's a lot of opportunities that are missed uh, that need uh, to be taken care of. But when having worked in this area for many years, uh, my concern is usually one. If we've done all these studies and we could fill this room with piles of books and studies and reports about these issues, if we understand the issues on the ground, why is in their action? Why is in their change? I strongly believe that this needs to start with political will to change. Um, there is a lot of progress being made. Um, many of you are probably aware about the CADA platform um, where countries have been sitting down, multi-stakeholders sitting down and identifying priorities in their countries and identifying opportunities and coming up with investment plans. Donors who have created a single platform uh, to support these investments, and Todd alluded to that. And um, what, what we see is that, the, you know, the question is then what? We have more than 20 countries that have completed their CADA investment plans and they are negotiating with donors. We see a lot of uh, slow progress there. Opportunities, again, that are missed. When you look at regional integration, there are a lot of platforms for the, the regional economic communities, uh, multiple of them covering you know, different countries in Africa. The last five years, there hasn't been much movement apart from the East African community. Uh, I think there is a lot of progress that needs to be made. There is adequate information there should be political will to move forward. And I believe that the key is really empowering people, the civil society, empowering the private sector to engage governments, to be able to sit down. What I saw in that movie is people who are complaining about different things, but they don't have an avenue for communicating that uh, to the interested parties. There's a lot of rent seeking, definitely. And those loopholes can be closed, but there has to be political will. So who has the skin in the game? I like it when World Bank and USAID and other groups, you know, do these kinds of analysis and reports. I would say you need to empower the local people to be able to voice these concerns and sit down with their leaders and demand change. I think it would be very interesting to <clears throat> take this analysis down to the organizations and countries and leaders involved and sit down with them and ask for action. Action that's trackable, action that's transparent, and people can see what change is needed. Policy reform alone <clears throat> will not generate the needed results. We know that, as the ambassador was saying, we need tools and technologies. We need institutional change. And all these need to work in tandem, not in isolation. A regional approach is usually good. It's the way to go. Some of these countries are very small. They don't have capacity uh, to do things on their own. And we know that when those efforts are isolated, their transactions are higher. So we need to broaden those markets we have uh, evidence that there is a huge growing uh, middle class in Africa. Estimates have it that we have 60 million people now in that category. This is going to reach 100 million in about three to five years. 
and that's demanding different qualities of food, different technologies from what is traditionally grown. And I think the key is connecting these smallholder farmers to these urban markets and then leaping forward to regional markets or even doing both. Africa is urbanizing at an incredible rate. In about 20 years from now, African urban populations will exceed rural populations. According to estimates, Africa's top 18 cities will have a combined spending power of $1.3 trillion. But what we see is a lot of disconnect between what farmers are growing and what urban regions are demanding. And I think between the farmer and the consumer, that's where there's a huge potential of job creation, especially for the youth who are very disinterested <coughs> uh, with agriculture. When I grew up, I got interested in agriculture because I saw my mom using a hand hoe. And I thought that was really ridiculous that in this world, we could use such a tool. And my mom would spend a whole week tilling a quarter plot of an acre, a whole month tilling an acre. When she's done at the end of the month on the other side, the weeds are back at the beginning and she has to start again. There is no way I could go back and become a farmer. So I became an advocate for change. And I'm still doing that. I think we need change. We need it today. And I think it can be done. The world has better technology. The world has funds that can be able to do that. But we need to empower the local people, build institutional capacity in countries, instead of trying to help from Washington, D.C. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Appreciate it. So I, I, I like this panel. I think it's a very good mix of, uh, of uh, private and public sector and, and both uh, governments uh, uh, that are dealing with this problem as well as international uh, governments in the United States government are trying to help. Uh, Marcelo, uh, we, uh, we brought you up onto the podium, not to, not to give an address per se, but uh, because uh, the Vice President Mukhtar had said maybe there was a few things you wanted to fill in on the report uh, from the World Bank point of view before we turn it over to questions. Uh, so I'll leave it to you if you want so to say something before we go to questions and answers. Just very quickly, and, and let me thank you, Steve, and all the panelists for, for the incredible contributions. Uh, I want to also acknowledge uh, two of the authors of this report that are here with us, uh, Paul Brenton and Gods the Isik uh, are here in the room and they can answer more specific questions. My role is uh, twofold. One is I'm the person that signs the checks. <laughs> That's a good person. And that keeps me more or less updated to what's happening. And the second is uh, they pay me to listen. <laughs> I listen to some 200 economists. I imagine that's Babel. <laughs> but day in and day out, I sit in meetings with these 200 economists that are totally dedicated to Africa, exclusively to Africa. And this is one of the issues where they really feel very passionately about. And if there are two messages I would like to leave with you uh, out of my listening uh, are these. The first is Africa has been spectacularly successful at integrating with the rest of the world through the commodity trade, selling minerals to China, oil, gas, that integrates you with the rest of the world. But it has been a failure in integrating with itself. Uh, now you may say, so what? As long as money comes in, uh, that's fine. The thing is that the globalization of Africa has not created the jobs and ultimately the poverty reduction that Africa needs. Those two will come from the integration with itself. And what you heard today about food integration or food market integration is even worse when you speak about service integration. And by services, I don't just mean that teachers in Kenya, which are in oversupply, cannot go to Tanzania where they are undersupply, or accountants in Ghana, which I'm told are very good, cannot operate anywhere else in West Africa where there is a shortage of them. It's also true about trucking, which is probably the most important logistics now impairing commerce in Africa. It's also true about finance, where you cannot really operate from one country to the other without very country-specific requirements that make it impossible to trade in capital. So 
what is true for food is true for service. It's also true for perhaps the one genial idea that made Southeast Asia so successful, and is the idea that the production chain can be split vertically and components of the final product can be produced in different countries. So when you buy a car here in the US, you're probably buying pieces from 17 or 18 countries. The computer control continuously shifting gearbox is still made in Japan, but the tires are probably made in Vietnam. So countries can attach themselves to the production process at the level of technology they are capable of. That's perfect for Africa, and for Africa capturing or beginning to capture some of what we calculate are 80 million jobs that Ch China has to shed over the next 10 years. That ain't going to happen while Africa cannot trade with itself. There is no one single country that can incorporate all these components into a final product of manufacturing. So that's the first message. The integration with itself, this job and poverty agenda, is the one that has remained unattended. And the second message, if I may, is very much along the, the lines of what our colleagues were saying, we know what the problem is. We know what the problem is. And so far, we acted only on half of the problem, which is relatively, relatively speaking, the easy half, and is the tariff barriers. You can sign a free trade agreement, and in paper, your tariff, your import tariffs, go down. You may be a member now of the custom unions, which supposedly allows products to go in and out at zero additional tax due to origin. That's half of the problem. That's where we acted quickly, and that's where the politics have been welcoming. The free trade agreements are good for photo ops. <laughs> we don't have action. It's in the non-tariff barriers. It's in the standards, the regulations, the bureaucracy, the corruption. Mm. And I don't think we have action there. It's not just because of the political economy constraint. I totally agree the will is not there. It's that it takes two to tango. And in multi-country trade, it takes many people to tango. Imagine how difficult it is. I'm Argentinian, so I know how difficult tango is. <laughs> <laughs> More than two people to dance, it becomes almost impossible if there is no will. In this case, you have to align the politics across borders. Now, we've been thinking about it. Some of the checks I'm signing these days is for a program of political economy analysis, both for trade integration, for energy integration, and for natural resource management in Africa. And what's coming out of this other group of people doing political economy analysis is we need end games. We need Hail Marys. We need a play that will change it all over the actors, the political actors. Um, which ones those could be? This report has a couple of proposals. Uh, one is a charter of small traders' rights that would be signed by the politicians but would be monitored by civil society. That could take us to some uh, distance, not the whole way, but it's these kind of ideas that will compromise and, uh, and commit uh, politicians in public that will carry the day. I finish with one small point now, and it's the following. This agenda, particularly the food agenda, or the food integration agenda, or the food market integration agenda, is not just about poverty and about food security. To me, it's about gender. And we didn't have the time to, I will recommend that you go to the website indicated at the back of the report where you will find other reports, particularly this one called Defragmenting Africa. And this other report, there is some statistics that, you know, as a father of a daughter, uh, I worry about. <coughs> the average female trader between Congo and Rwanda, which are the two price differences in East Africa that are worth trying to cross the border, has an 80% chance of having to bribe a customs official every time she crosses, and a 50% chance of getting physically harassed, read rape. Now, if you cross every week uh, with your ex in your back, uh, and you do that for the following 20 years because that's your livelihood, how likely is it that you have been raped already? <coughs> so we have an agenda there that is low hanging fruit that we can make tremendous progress very quickly and that I think deserves all our attention. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Marcelo. Um, I'm, uh, we're going to go over a little on our time here, but I'm conscious of your own schedules because many of you may have places to go. Uh, but what I'm going to do, uh, so you all don't get mad at me because I want to cut the question and answers kind of short, is we do have some coffee and tea and, and refreshments out front. So I think there's going to be some time for those of you who can stay a bit longer to, uh, to engage with some of the panelists uh, over a couple